In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Question. Do you believe in angels? Do you believe in angels, those sort of spiritual beings that appear in all the Abrahamic religions? Uh, of course, Christianity, but also Judaism and Islam. Also, Zoroastrianism and Baha'i faith and uh, in other faiths as well. Do you believe in angels? In 2008, a survey of Canadians that sampled a couple, I think it was 1,500 people, found that 67% of Canadians believe in angels. Uh, interestingly, a, a study in, in America found in 2009 found about 55%, although it was up from previous years. And 20% of the people in that survey who said they were not religious reported that they believed that they had experienced the protection of guardian angels in their lifetime. 20% of people who identified as non-religious. That's way more even like global warming is like 36%. So there's a lot of people that believe that angels exist. What's interesting is that if you want to um, cause your eyeballs to melt with sheer cheesiness factor, just simply do a Google image search on angels and you will see some very cheesy art uh, because angels have become a place where people like to project their fantasies of what uh, anything pretty much. So you can find all kinds of angels. Perhaps the most egregious uh, sin against art that I found was uh, something that Jamie pointed me to, which was to Google uh, kitten angels. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole genre, <laughs> pages and pages of people who have photoshopped images of kittens with little wings, and uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was mind-boggling. It starts to get real for us, though, when we start to turn to websites, for example, that talk about encounters people have had with angels. There are several of these websites that just collect stories of people who have had encounters with angels. Remember I said that something like 55% uh, of Americans believe in the presence of angels. Uh, I figure what the percentages of people that have overall who say that they've experienced the, uh, the protection of angels in their lives, but it's a large number. And I know several people personally who have had experiences like that. Um, Interestingly, in the literature, there's lots of examples of this, too. Uh, one of my favorites are, are two stories from the sailing world. One was this guy who was doing a circumnavigation. He was sailing alone around the world, and he became very sick, probably from, from food poisoning, and he passed out in his boat uh, under the deck, and uh, a storm came on and started buffeting the boat, and he was too sick to even climb up and, and save his boat, and he was sure he was going to die. But he, as he was trying to claw his way up the ladder uh, to get onto the, uh, the deck, uh, he saw a man behind the helm, and he was dressed in old sailor-like garb from you know, the turn of the century. And this man behind the helm, this ghost figure, just kind of nodded to him, and then he passed out again. And you know, he said whether that was a, a feverish hallucination or whether that was a real thing is difficult to know, but he does know that his boat survived a storm that it shouldn't have survived without someone at the wheel. Similar story. Uh, there was a, a young man named Zach Sunderland who did the same thing. He sailed around the world alone. He was 15 years old when he did it, though. And uh, Zach had a very fancy uh, radar system to look out for traffic while he was asleep. And it would wake up every few minutes and search the horizon for ships that are not intercepting course, and it would raise an alarm if there was one. Well, one night he woke up. He just felt something was wrong. Something wasn't quite right. So he woke up, and he turned on his radar and it wouldn't turn on. Um, There's a power failure and so he went up to the deck and sure enough there was one of these gigantic uh, you know, intercontinental transport ships that was bearing down on him and he was able to turn his motor and get out of the way in time. But he believed this was a heavenly intervention that, that saved his life. As I said, as we start to get into these stories, we start to see something very real. We start to hear stories that people believe that God has intervened directly in their lives uh, to save them from bad circumstances. Uh, recently, I've been thinking of a couple of stories of angels inter either intervening or not intervening. Uh, there was uh, a case about uh, 10 or 12 years ago when I was a hospital chaplain of a young boy. He was probably about five or six, and I was on call the night that he came into the hospital. Um, I worked at a level one trauma center, so we'd get the really bad cases, and unfortunately, this, this young boy had had a, uh, he had had, uh, a seizure, but the part of the brain where the seizure happened is the part that controls breathing. So he had had some significant brain damage as a result of his, of his, uh, of his seizure. And uh, as the chaplain, I was the one who met the families they came in and took them to the emergency room, the, the actual trauma room where they were working on their child, and sat with them as they sat in these two chairs. And uh, he, he made it through those first couple of hours, and they put him in the pediatric ward. And at that point, his care for the chaplaincy was transferred to a specialist that we had in pediatric trauma. And uh, she was working with them, but I would check in on them from time to time because I had made that initial connection with them. 
And I, I will never forget the day that I ran to them on the elevator. Uh, I ran into uh, the, the father, and he was, um, he had something with him, and it was a little coat hanger, one of those old children's coat hangers, and on it was a Superman costume. And he was taking the Superman costume to his son, who was fighting this, this thing. Uh, his son didn't make it, by the way, uh, but he hung in there for a couple of weeks. And that's the sort of story that haunts you when you do that kind of work uh, for quite a while. I knew lots of other kids that did survive really strange circumstances and were, were brought through, but I was always kind of puzzled about why it would seem that, that you know, sometimes God would intervene in some cases and, and not in others. And that's the problem with these miracle stories and the problem with the angel stories is what do we do when God doesn't intervene? It seems clear enough when God does that we, we love to sort of celebrate, rejoice, and give glory to God, but in the rough times are we able to similarly give glory to God, perhaps crying first and then finding the joy. There was no miracle to save our daycare, unfortunately. Uh, we knew for months that we had a problem, but uh, there was nothing to intervene. There was no angel, as they call them in the nonprofit world, who came in with a large stash of cash to bail us out. We knew that with a large infusion of capital, we could refit the space, the architecture, we could change some other things, and we could perhaps make it sustainable into the future. But it didn't happen for us. So what do we do with that? Well, I would suggest one solution is, as resurrection people, we believe that to get to the resurrection, you have to go through the death part. That perhaps if the daycare dies, it creates an opportunity for a new ministry to arise in this place. I would suggest a second comfort we could take is something from the Old Testament, this passage that we have in which Jacob is encountering the angels, and he, he has this wonderful vision. If we understand the context, we understand that, that Jacob, first of all, was not such a nice guy. He was a... Uh, he was an expert in, in, in frauding people. Uh, he had already gotten away with a couple of big frauds and uh, committed against his own family members, nonetheless, including his brother. And so he's on the run, and in the midst of that uncertainty and that fear, he comes to a very ordinary place, and he has this vision. And from that vision, he understands that even in that ordinary place, God is present, and he names it Bethel. I believe that this is a Bethel. If this is a place where God's highway comes and there's much traffic back and forth, that God has been present in the lives of the children that have come through this daycare and through the work of the teachers and in their lives as they've been transformed as well. But that kind of ordinariness of the angels, the fact that the angels are not just these heavenly beings that intervene miraculously in car crashes and pediatric hospitals, but in fact is there every day in a way, is remarkable, is remarkable. I think that those who know children sometimes uh, hesitate to call them angels all the time. Uh, I'm not sure that they are. I'm sure that uh, I know that my three and a half year old is not always a little angel. Uh, and I'm sure that's probably true of the daycare staff as well. Perhaps they were not always the angels that we would like to believe them. Because both children and teachers are very easily, just like angels, the object of our fantasies. We sort of imagine these perfect teachers who do such a better job than we could possibly do of taking care of our children or that these children could never do anything wrong, they're so beautiful and so innocent. Innocent, ha! <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, I think probably for the daycare workers, they, they, their experience is probably, I don't know this for certain, I've never done that work as a professional, but I, I imagine that their experience is probably that they're just holding back the waves of chaos that threaten to crash around them, that they're just managing to hold everything kind of together, because that's what life is like just kind of holding everything together when the waves of chaos want to crash in on us. And from time to time, our lives show us that when we're doing that work, miraculous things happen, often in very ordinary ways. Maybe, you know, uh, if you're working in a daycare and things start to see like they're gonna spin out of control, just at that moment, something happens that saves the whole thing. I don't know, I'm sure we could hear some stories like that later. So my challenge for us, both as a congregation, as individuals, is as you consider a place like Messiah Daycare, and you consider its closure, that you look on the other side of that toward the resurrection possibilities that are there. And you also do so in the confidence that this is a sacred place, where that traffic of angels back and forth not only has happened in a past tense at the daycare, but continues to happen perhaps in a new way. That even in the midst of the uncertainty and fear that, that Jacob certainly felt as he was fleeing his family, um, that perhaps even in the midst of that, God reveals himself in new and miraculous ways. That all we have to do is to have the eyes to see that vision. All we have to do is look for it, and we will see it. The activity of angels everywhere. 
So now is my, ours are uh, custom as a community after I, I preach, I'll sort of open this up and see if anybody has any, anything to share. I'd be particularly interested in the stories of the miraculous uh, and, and kind of the way in which God intervenes and shows God's presence, especially in the context of the daycare, but 